you have tables of all these placements and all the frequencies and in a QEG report you can have 50 pages of this. You have a map where red is too much, blue is too little. Okay? So you see you want to go change this. You want to beef up 11 to 14 hertz because from the center to the front, there's a deficiency of alpha, for example. And there are certain patterns that go with certain disorders. And as I mentioned, you can, pull, you can have a discriminant function of traumatic brain injury, of Alzheimer's, of affective disorder, of bipolar, and so forth. They're getting close to a discriminant function of PTSD. Uh, because you can have PTSD in a couple ways, of course, like wartime, or you also get traumatic brain injury. But also, you can have developmental trauma, which is um, orphans, childhood, child abuse, or having really rotten parents. And the brains look the same. Uh, so, if you have I said we, we had trained it one side at a time uh, years ago, and now we do typically about four channels at once, training all 248 variables at once. Then what you can do if you have, let's say, an early cognitive decline where theta is all, excess theta is all over the brain, aside from the 248 variables you're training at once, you also do theta down at all four sites and try to pull that theta down and it can help alleviate can actually stop uh, cognitive decline. Um, you have to get people rather early. So the four or five people that I'm doing that with are either psychologists um, or people who know about me personally. I do not display this on my advertise. I don't advertise this. It's just too early. That was one of my concerns about doing this talk. I, said, I don't have real data. I have some cases where I showed that pulling down theta all over the brain, actually you can get a different brain map. A person will look like their brain is cleaned up, just like Daniel Amen saw in the spec scan. Uh, and then when people say, okay, I also have OCD, and that bothers me a lot, so I say, okay, so in addition to pulling theta down all over, I'll pull down high beta, 25 to 30 hertz. And they come back in a week or two and say, I'm much better, I sleep better. You know, the, OCD people sometimes will have poor sleep and their brain is fussing all over the place. So if you can pull that down, if there's an electrophysiological correlate, you can help people dramatically. Um, so <clears throat> the, the quantitative EEG shows deviations from the norm in terms of standard deviations or z-scores. So that's why they call it Z-score training. Um, and so you're, you're training those variables and the, and the 248 variables, um, you're training those to come to a zero Z-score, a normal level. The nice part about QEEG and neurofeedback is that you get the same information on the QEEG that you use to train. It's isomorphic, isomorphic information. You train four sites at once. You can train all these different variables, which I mentioned. Um, about 10 or 15 years ago, when they were doing coherence training, you found that that was off. Sometimes the coherence training would go too much. So hypocoherence might end up being hypercoherence. So the Z-score training was invented to help continually balance the brain in a dynamic way so that it was always going towards normal. So you don't have to worry about odd things happening. Um, one study that's a good idea to know about, Beauregard and Levesque, and then there's another one by Levesque and Beauregard, same year, they happen to be married, 
Um, they did a pre and post study with ADD kids, pre and post um, fMRI, neuropsych, rating scales, and so forth. They did a randomized placebo control study. They had one group which was sham, so they were doing, they thought they were doing neurofeedback. Therapists nor the patient, which were children in this case, knew who was getting the treatment, okay? Placebo controlled study. And in fact, uh, the brain changed, and the symptoms changed, and the neuropsych changed. So it is changing the brain. Neurofeedback is not training you to relax and, you know, deal with your symptoms in some kind of psychological way. The brain is getting changed. Um, and this was kind of how they did it. I would just encourage you to get that reference. Um, it's somewhat illuminating. Um, okay, it tells about those subjects and so forth. And they, they did three 60-minute sessions per week. Uh, and 20 sessions, and then they did another protocol after that. Um, and Frank Duffy, the uh, very well-known and respected neurologist at Harvard, said, in my opinion, if any medication had demonstrated such a wide spectrum of efficient e efficacy, it would be universally accepted and widely used. So HEG, I told you about, I showed it to you and they can assess with infrared imaging. Um, Carmen, Jeffrey Carmen, who is in New York, Manliest New York, you can buy this system yourself. One day of training, that's all you would need the rest of your life. It is elegant, beyond belief. It is really elegant. You have to buy the system to use it, of course, but he took 100 migrainers who were at their last stop I don't, aside from the migrainers that I see in my practice, which is pretty regular, um, migraines must be awful. The medication is not fun for a lot of people. And your life is, you know, it's terrible when you have these on a regular basis. He took 100, 100 of those and did six HEG sessions. 90% reported significantly positive results. I have a little less, I have about a 75% success rate. Um, it's very effective, and they're watching movies they like. That's his system. I have a lady with 20 year history of migraines who was referred by one of the top headache guys in New York, neurologist uh, Alexander Maskow. He refers me a couple people a month. Unlike most doctors, he thinks if you can get rid of the problem with bad feedback, why give medication? Sensible, right? 20-year uh, history of migraines, took triptan several times a month, did eight sessions. Migraines are gone. That was six years ago. They haven't come back. She would learn the diaphragmatic breathing whenever she feels one coming on, you know, an aura, uh, which is about half the migraines. She does the breathing and it's gone. So, you can be very useful. Um, okay, dementia. I have a chapter in this book by Paula Hartman Stein. I didn't hand this chapter out. It's called Brain Brightening. <coughs> and uh, Paula said, don't hand that chapter out. I gotta buy the book. It's a magnificent book. Cognitive. Um, cognitive methods of helping the elderly. It's magnificently conceived and very well put together. So um, there was a study that I referred to that I actually wrote the protocol for. Nobody gave me credit, but um, where these authors did neurofeedback with frontal temporal lobe dementia uh, and. I told them what tests to do, they ignored me, and I said, don't take people who are middle or advanced, and they ignored me. Uh, but they still got positive results, neurofeedback and, and, and getting improved memory. 
So I don't take people who, or with that one exception, um, who are that far along in their dementia. If they're mid-level or more advanced, because I don't want to disappoint people. I've had patients, I got a referral from Brain Research Lab about 12, 15 years ago, and they sent me, they were doing a normative database trying to collect data for normal people. But they saw this case, Tony, and they said, uh-oh, got a frontal problem here. They had frontal theta all over the place. And so they sent them to me, and I did about 50 sessions with them. I did a pre-treatment neuropsych, and then I did a post-treatment. By the way, you can do a neuropsych every year with Medicare. But in this case, um, I Medicare paid for the neuropsych. And he, with a 140 IQ, he was scoring 10th percentile in the Wisconsin card zone. And, but everything else was kind of clean. He was an artist, made his living as art. So, you know, a lot of his visual process, visual, you know, assessment instruments were fine. And after two or three neurofeedback sessions, he came back and said, my wife says I don't stumble with words anymore. And I hit, this is an artist, this is a sculptor. He says, and I can pack a suitcase. Well, if you're declining in your visual process and packing a suitcase might be hard. Um, we did neurofeedback for about 50 sessions over about a year and a half, and then he stopped. And they did a post-QEG and got the brain research lab, and Leslie Pritchett calls me up and says, what the hell did you do? His brain is better. I said, well, you sent to me. Uh, so I did narrow feedback. I've had that a couple of times when doctors send me a patient for neurofeedback to get them off like epilepsy medication and depression. And in the first year I got a patient off her epilepsy medication, no seizures. They went away. And second year I got her off her depression medication. He calls me up and he says, Harry, what are you doing? You're gonna She's better. She doesn't need medication. You're going to run me out of a job. I said, Dr. X, you sent her to me for that. And so I was trying to figure out what he did believe me in the first place. or uh, And what I thought is, what I think is, is that doctors have a static model of the brain. And if they can figure out the medications that go along with that brain and the patient's symptoms go down, then they figure out the puzzle. What they don't think of is that if a patient is coming to me for electrophysiological training and I'm at least saying that I'm getting their brain better, maybe I'm doing something. So that, for example, proper medication six months ago is over medication now. Because the brain is getting better and it doesn't need the damn medication. So they might, and so what I have to tell patients is that kind of construct, that the doctors are having a fixed sense of what your brain is and that might not be true. So what I tell them is, um, I think we're gonna go to Darth Vader. Okay, uh, I named my computers. This is Igor, and this is Darth Vader. We'll go to Darth Vader and boot up Avatar for channel. Okay? Oh wait, don't do anything. We have to have to finish this part. Um, so what I do is I have the patient. I say, take that little that little notice out of the drug package with four point type that nobody can read, and look at the over the over-medication symptoms. And then if they're true, tell that to the doctor and he'll have to reduce your medication. He doesn't have to believe me. Okay. So, okay, the Brain Research Labs did an incredibly elegant study. They took, um, well they say 44, I think they did. Anyway, they took a number of patients, half Everybody complained they were elderly about 65. 
They all had memory complaints. They did QEGs on them. They got them eight or nine years later, half of them declined, half of them did not. The QEGs that were done a decade earlier, which ones predicted the decline? Okay. It's high theta all over the brain. That's excess theta. See the little scale here? And the, uh, the non-decliners stayed normal. Black and black and is pretty much normal. The Harvard people, when I did a dementia course for five days a couple years ago, they say they can predict 20 years in advance with the pet tau assessment. So in other words, if somebody's starting to decline, you can do a QEG in mail, if you want. Um, there are substance abuse, this helps with substance abuse, it's really pretty good, it's about a 75% um, success rate. And epilepsy, actually that's how neurofeedback was discovered as a cure for epilepsy. It actually can get rid of them with long-term follow-up. I have a partial complex seizure guy now. I did about 40 sessions. His partial complex seizures, little baby seizures that annoyed him. Didn't interrupt his life at all. He just didn't like them, so he came to me and we did the 12 to 15 hertz at C4 with the four, three other channels. And we got rid of them in about 40 sessions. And then a year went by, or a couple of years went by, and he said, Larry, they're coming back. And we did about five sessions, and now they're gone. So uh, maybe it doesn't always work, but it works enough that it should be taken seriously. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I want you to see what it looks like. Um, it's a daunting thing to get into. If I were, I wouldn't do it, I wouldn't get involved in this if it were, if I were my age right now. I get young people who are tech oriented, like Ben, uh, to, to work with me so that we can do these complicated protocols. You can have dialogue boxes that are, um, have 150 choices. Let's boot up, not the four channel, let's boot up the 19 channel training, okay? On Avatar. Um, let me see if, and while you're doing that, okay, wait a minute. Now how is it, and you're gonna do something here that's gonna change things, right? Uh, no, he's gonna operate it from here. He's gonna just. Did you want it on the screen? You want that up there? Yeah. Let me see what we've got here. I will tell you about, oh wait, okay, don't do it quite yet, okay? There is a guy, neuropsychiatrist in Turkey, who did quantitative EEG guided neurofeedback for schizophrenia. When I learned of this, I got a relationship with him, emailed him, I got the article pre pre-publication, I was going to help edit it, and it turns out he didn't need me at all. It got published. Tanj, it's in your references. Tanju Sorelli took 48, 52, three, drop, three or four dropped out. 47 showed significant improvements. Here's a pre-post MMPI. Now, I have questions about this. I mean, MMPI translated into Turkish? Mm -hmm. Ralph Reitan taught me that <laughs> you change a session, you, know, you change an assessment instrument. Mm -hmm. In any way, you have to renorm it, okay? You also use my C43 MMPI, such as that. Okay, so, but he did pre and post clinical interviews, neuropsych stuff, rating scales, uh, and look what happened. MMPI, the 47 out of 48 are normal. Now, I mean, we all kind of believe that schizophrenics have a different brain. And that there's some kind of funny brain there. I mean, I think most of us would believe that. Okay. But neurofeedback could bring the vast majority into a normal range. 
It's like, wow, that is something. One more thing, Beauregard 2012, the reference is there, but it's, it isn't published. He did neurofeedback with a whole bunch of multiple sclerosis people, and he showed you can, en you can enhance, maybe heal, my own sheep. And when I saw that, I just said, oh my God, a treatment for multiple sclerosis, my God, that's amazing. He hasn't been able to get it published. They won't publish. It's crazy. Okay, let's let's show what these programs look like. Okay, Apple. I will try to narrate. We'll have to use the um, this guy. You want nineteen channel? Yeah, do nineteen channel. Four channel, you can um, train four, 248 variables at once. For most patients, that's fine. You're training almost the whole brain. But if you really want to go to town and train all 19 sites at once, there they are. All 19 sites. We'll just kind of get it going. This is a pretend brain, not a real brain be too long to hook up. Okay, there's EEG. It's kind of okay looking, I guess. Okay, that's the raw. So you can be seeing this. Then on another screen, you can put a movie. As the movie is flickering, it's training the brain to become normal. Okay, go to, uh, go to Z-scores. Okay, you're training, okay, absolute power, relative power, Asymmetry, power ratios, go drag, drag down carefully. These are the monic these are the statistics that you're managing. About 4,500. You usually don't train them all at once. What you will do is try to figure out what is true for that patient as far as deficits go. You can do this three-dimensionally, and you can even train regions of interest, ROI. Go to ROI. Oh wait, go to maps. You saw the color maps before. Now here, they're live. And you're training frequencies in all kinds of different variables. Uh, let's just say you have a lot of data. You can see the brain is very complicated. <laughs> now to go to ROI. So, you can now wrote, okay, so you're training now uh, default mode networks as defined by Kaiser, which is regions of the brain that have to do with certain kinds of psychological issues or parameters. If they have a left frontal, go to, <coughs> look at over here. It's probably too small for you to read. Uh, go to the right frontal lobe. Frontal lobe. Actually, show them the whole menu. Show them the whole menu. Just drag it. No, drag it down. You can do the angular gyrus, anterior cingulate, fusiform gyrus. You can do any of those. Just pick parahippocampus. Click that. There we go. You can train this on the fly. <coughs> you can do both sides, right or left. It's incredible. It's just incredible. This is going to be the treatment of the future for brain problems. By the way, there's new methods that are developed. Where the innovations that are going on are way ahead of their ability to research. I did a review paper on current trends in neurofeedback. You, you can have it. I sent it out for you. The innovations are so incredible that we can't keep up with it. What we're probably going to have to be doing is case series. Try to pick a diagnosis. Try to make sure that they're about the same. Someday funding will be um, 
provided so that, let's say, can you imagine if of the, uh, I did a quick market thing on schizophrenia. If half of the known schizophrenics are in a hospital and then half of those responded to neurofeedback, which is arduous. It can take 80 sessions. But if that would save, and if I'm assuming $85,000 a year in our taxpayer money going for these people. And here's the, uh, this is the threshold. This line is the, all of the variables that you're training, which might be 50. It's squashed into one z-score metric. And then it's an auto threshold that keeps chasing your own data so that you're always at an optimal level of reward. The reward is a flickering movie. The reward could be sounds. The reward could be an animation. It can be a computer game. Um, you know, it's the, the field is developed in such a... And I, I figure I'm going to use movies because I like movies. So... Um, Anybody have a favorite area they want to see trained? Pecunias? What was that? Frontal. Frontal. Okay, go to frontal. One side or both? Oh, I don't know. Insula, inferior tendon. You go all the way. It's way up there. Frontal's. Yeah, you can do a whole lot more. There we go. Frontal's the first line. There we go. Twist it around and something needs to go underneath. Let's see the bottom. Okay. The red means too much. Yellow is a little bit too much. Uh, blue and green would be a little too too little. So you're seeing this train being trained live. Are there problems with this statistically? What's the big problem, as with MRI and other images? It's computer image. This is an ideal brain. It may not be the patient's brain. So you hope everything's in the right place. But if you've ever done dissections of real brains, it's pretty packed in there. There's not a lot of wiggle room. You know, it's um, a packed in place. So there we are. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to get rid of this. You know, it's, it, to, to, to imagine. <coughs> Imagine that we can fix brains. We can get rid of migraines in eight sessions. We can actually stop early dementia. It's outrageous to even think that this is possible. But what if we could do that? Thanks for your attention. Everyone, now we're going to take a break for lunch.